I've been creating aquariums, paludariums, and riparians that include plant growth above the waterline for years now. These significantly improve how the designs function, as well as minimize maintenance, which I think we can all agree is the worst part about this hobby. These are easy to implement, and nearly all of the enclosure styles more or less use the same principles. Understanding the difference between those can help as well. At the very top, you have the aquarium and terrarium. An aquarium, of course, is an enclosure that simulates an aquatic environment, while a terrarium does the same for a terrestrial environment. Each can be as minimal or elaborate as you'd like, but I'd argue that the best results are achieved by implementing as many natural processes as possible. For example, adding plants to an aquarium or springtails to a terrarium helps stabilize their conditions. Success is still possible without them, but a multifaceted approach increases its likelihood. The number of setups under this umbrella is vast, but the three pertinent to this discussion are the vivarium, the paludarium, and the riparium. Vivariums are generally placed under the terrarium category, but all of these setups, including aquariums, are technically vivariums once they house animals for the sake of observation. To avoid going down a rabbit hole of semantics, I'll place vivarium under the terrarium category because that's how it's commonly represented within the nature design hobby, and I think this delineation is the most practical approach. Ripariums, on the other hand, fall exclusively under the aquarium category, and paludariums lie somewhere in between. Adequately distinguishing between these can help us better communicate what we're creating and why. We'll put it like this, a vivarium is always a terrarium, but a terrarium isn't always a vivarium. As explained, it becomes a vivarium when it's meant to house terrestrial land-dwelling animals, like geckos or snakes. A terrarium or vivarium may include a water feature without ending up in another category. However, once that becomes the primary focus for whatever reason, you end up in the realm of paludarium. The distinguishing factor for paludariums is the presence of land and a prominent body of water. Although they may house terrestrial animals, they're usually better suited for semi-aquatic or fully aquatic animals or some combination. There's a gray area here, but I differentiate a vivarium with a water feature from a paludarium based on the amount of water compared to the animal it's for. Excluding some really small critters, if the animals are able to actively use the water for more than just drinking, I usually call it a paludarium. In nature, transitional environments full of vegetation, adjoining bodies of water are called riparian zones. Therefore, the plants growing here can be called riparian or marginal plants. In most cases, paludariums are designed to mimic the transitional area between land and water to accommodate the types of animals found within them. At the water's edge, the land becomes fully submerged. A riparian mimics this area with a heavy focus on riparian plants. Although it may include driftwood or other minor elements above the water, all of the land must remain under the surface. Essentially, they're an aquarium emphasizing above the water vegetation. An aquarium may include above the rim plant growth, but I wouldn't consider it a riparium unless that's the primary focus of the design. These concepts originate from nature, and looking at it as such gives a complete perspective. The terrarium and vivarium would be located in fully terrestrial areas. Occasional water pockets may be present, but they're away from anything significant. Moving closer and into the transitional riparian zones between land and water is where the paludarium would reside. While the riparium is represented beyond the water's edge in the shallows full of marginal plants, and everything beyond would be an aquarium. The setups designed to mimic the areas in the riparian zones are where we can better understand why we should incorporate marginal plants beyond aesthetics. In nature, these zones act as a biofilter and are crucial for water quality. Many factors are at play here, but our focus is on the plants. They sequester impurities that would otherwise foul the water. Of course, the same applies to an enclosed environment like a paludarium, riparium, or aquarium. If you've been keeping fish for any length of time, I'm sure you know about the nitrogen cycle. For those who don't, organic waste within the system produces ammonia, which is toxic to livestock. Beneficial bacteria consume this and release nitrite, which is also toxic. And finally, other beneficial bacteria convert this nitrite into nitrate. Although safe in small amounts, excess buildup over time will become toxic. That's why we do water changes. However, plants not only absorb this nitrate byproduct, completely removing it from the water column, but they also take care of nitrite and ammonia. If the plant mass is robust enough to consume the majority of present nitrate, then the environment becomes stable, which means fewer water changes are needed. Something else to consider is that both terrestrial and aquatic plants perform this function, but they're not created equal. Aquatics are limited by the amount of carbon dioxide in the water. 
Terrestrial plants, on the other hand, have greater access to CO2 in the air. Thus, they grow faster and more effectively process the water without the need for artificial CO2 injection. So although all plants produce a more favorable environment for livestock, obtaining this equilibrium is much easier by implementing terrestrial plant growth. That's why I put them in nearly all of my aquatic setups and how I'm able to maintain them. If I had to perform water changes on all of these each week, not only would it be a waste, but there's no way I could keep up. I take the time to explain all of this because I believe that understanding the difference between the enclosure styles as well as why we'd even use marginal plants to begin with helps make design decisions more straightforward. Additionally, terrestrial plants are more accessible than most aquatics both from a care and cost perspective. I'll add that growing many of these house plants in an aquatic setting is surprisingly easier and less work than in a pot. I know this has many of you wondering what plants are appropriate, while others probably went immediately to pothos. It's safe to say that nearly everybody has kept pothos in an aquarium at some point or another, but there's so much more out there that's better suited for this application than the common golden pothos. I love the plant and its countless varieties, but it wouldn't be my first choice. They're often sold in these small pots, but don't be fooled. They get massive, especially when they can grow freely outside. Now they're not going to reach that level of maturity indoors, but you get the point. Additionally, because of the way they trail around as they grow, they always need more support to keep them out of the water, unless you have them growing around your room. Otherwise, the leaves end up in the tank and melt off. That said, nearly everything that I've tried from the Eurasiae family, to which Pothos belongs, will happily grow in water. A few include Alocasia, Caladium, Peace Lily, Philodendron, Raphidophora, and Syngonium. I'll give other options, of course, but if I were to go through everything, we'd be here for hours. Don't worry though, I have you covered. I'm currently building a page on my website that's linked in the video description, which provides a more definitive list. I'll continue updating this as I experiment with new plants and learn more. What I will say is that the vast majority of plants commonly sold at nurseries and big box stores, regardless of what the tag says about its watering requirements, will grow marginally. It may seem challenging to do this, but there are a lot of easily implemented solutions, and the most obvious place to start is with a sloped substrate. The gradual slope downward is representative of what you'd see at the edge of a body of water, where the depth increases as you continue out. This is easily done, and so is adding the plants. The best rule of thumb, which applies to all of the methods you're about to see, is that just the roots and the very base of the stem should be submerged underwater. There are exceptions, and certain plants will tolerate being submerged farther, but this is a great place to begin with most of them. In practice, you'll simply nestle the roots within the substrate at the shallowest areas of the tank. This is a great option for transitional setups where the animals require a gentle slope into the water. That said, you want to avoid having any of the leaves touch the water. Long exposure to it will cause them to perish, as I explained with the pothos. I usually trim anything off that looks too close and wait for new foliage to fill the space. A bonus here is that many aquatic plants can double as a riparian plant. In fact, many of the aquatics that are commonly used will happily grow out of water and are usually propagated like that in a greenhouse prior to ever being in a tank. Stem plants like Hygrophila and Rotala immediately come to mind. They can be planted in the shallows as before, or down in the deeper areas. If planted close enough to the water's surface, they'll eventually breach it. Additionally, if you have an area where water meets land, it's easy to create a mossy embankment. It will grow both in and out of the water as it pleases. Most commonly available aquarium mosses will grow in this way, like java moss, but certain terrestrial mosses like thread moss can acclimate as well. Although this method is easy to implement, if you need a large volume of water or have a small tank to work in, it's not really the most ideal option. It can be somewhat alleviated by embedding rocks or driftwood into the medium to create a steeper drop off and thus maximize room in the water. Although it works, I feel like by that point you might as well skip the slope altogether and switch to what I use the most, hardscape. Plants are easily wedged in or anchored onto elements, which looks good and you're usually able to retain water volume. For example, if you're going to create a riparium that includes driftwood, why not have a branch at the water's surface to uplift plants? They may move around initially, but they'll stabilize as the roots develop. They could always be anchored on as well for an immediate hold with something like stainless steel wire, fishing line, or thread. You could also simply wedge them between the hardscape and whatever your tank's made out of. This works best with chunky driftwood or stones where you're able to leave a slight gap. As before, the plants will sit loosely in the space until their roots develop. Even though this works, I like to sandwich the roots between filter sponge and then behind the scape. This helps stabilize them immediately. 
Utilizing hardscape in this way is great in instances where you want plants, but it might not be conducive to the animals you have. Many fish, for example, will destroy any foliage in the tank. That said, they usually don't bother the roots quite as much. So with the foliage above the water, you can still have the benefits they provide and the improved aesthetic. That's what I did in the 350 gallon paludarium, for example, so the silver dollars couldn't eat the plants. Furthermore, the roots facilitate intricate and beautiful microhabitats. These visual barriers provide grazing surfaces for all inhabitants, as well as refuge for baby fish. Plus, they look really cool in my opinion, especially in a black water setup. It's a beneficial aspect to plants that I don't think should be overlooked. If you add the plants like this and anchor them with sponge or wire but don't want to see it, luckily it's easily hidden with moss. Hiding these with moss alone is fine, but you could go the extra mile and do the same thing with wicking fabric and do some really incredible stuff. In most cases, I use sphagnum moss, geotextile landscape fabric, a wicking fabric, or some combination. When in contact with water, these materials become engorged and thus provide a great growing surface for plants. Most of the plants that will grow in water will readily grow here as well. However, most mosses, vining plants like ficus pumula and marcravia, as well as ferns like rabbit's foot or maidenhair do especially well like this. You just have to shield the roots with something so they don't dry out. I typically resort to java or sphagnum moss. As I'm sure you could imagine, there's a lot of potential here because the plants will grow where you wick the water. I often combine these materials with pumps to create interesting and functional designs that appear naturalistic. And of course, all the benefits of the plants are attained as well. These methods are great, but as you can see, they get kind of complicated. What if you simply just want some plants growing up out of your tank? Well, the most accessible option are these hang-on planters. There are countless ready-made options. Here are just a few that I got on Amazon, for example. They just rest on the tank and the plants can go right in. The roots would eventually hide the planter to some extent, and I suppose fabric and moss could be used as well, but hardscape no doubt is the best bet to make them inconspicuous. You may run into the issue though where the plants go too far into the water. Things like filter sponge, lava rock, or leka could be used to bridge the gap accordingly. I have a quick and easy DIY option as well. Potted aquatic plants arrive in these little net cups, which are great for this. I just create a loop with stainless steel wire and hook it on. It's not the neatest option, but wire is cheap, and if you're going to be setting up a tank already, you likely have some of these. As I alluded to earlier, all of this is dependent on what style of enclosure you want to make. I typically use a combination of these elements as I'm trying to make any given design. There's something that I'm sure many of you picked up on, and that's that a lot of the plants that are suitable to grow in this way, pothos included, are toxic. That can be problematic if you have dogs or cats, or even with grazing animals like turtles. There are actually a lot of safe plants that are suitable for this though, so I made an indication on that list I mentioned earlier. However, if it still concerns you, which is completely understandable, or if you need a lid on the tank for whatever reason, all of these techniques still work in that case. Obviously, I have a glass one here, but you'll likely have the best results with the screen one because excess humidity won't ruin the view. The issue, however, is that you're going to lose out on a lot of water volume once you add the air space for the plants. You'll usually need a larger tank to compensate unless you keep nano fish. So for example, you may need a 20 gallon tank to have the same water volume as a 10 gallon that's completely full. That'll cost a little more up front, but it's still a viable option. Another one is to put all of the plants in an external system such as a sump, where they won't be able to be disturbed by anything, but you'll still have all the benefits of keeping them. I think you see now that it's easy to add these to a new design or retroactively to an old one. An important consideration though is that they must be clean before introduction. You always have the best results by doing a thorough clean and quarantine to fully rid the plants of pests and chemicals. If I'll be honest though, I usually don't take the time to do this unless I'm working with sensitive animals like amphibians. For general use, a thorough rinse to remove every bit of substrate is usually sufficient. Soaking the plants first helps significantly as well. The plants obviously don't enjoy this process, but they usually make it through just fine. There are certain plants though, like hemigraphis, which always get annoyed by this and end up droopy in the tank just after. As I've said in past videos, don't worry, they'll perk back up in just a few days. I've been cleaning a wide variety of plants like this for years with various aquatic animals and have never had issues. Regardless, as I always say, use your own discretion. To bring things full circle, I want to revisit what is probably the most commonly used plant in this way, pothos. I'm not saying don't use it at all, but that there are so many better options out there. I personally prefer things that mound or grow upward. 
Things like Calathea, Cryptanthus, Ferns, Fetonia, Hemigraphus, Maranta, Pilea, smaller Syngonium, and Spider plants. These and many others are just as available as Pothos and are easier to manage as they grow. When making your selections, be sure to see how big the plants are because most of them come in small and Pothos isn't the only one that grows large. Although they work great, take Monstera and Peace Lilies for example. They have the potential to get massive. Don't overcomplicate lighting either. There's no exact science I can give you in a video like this, but if it's bright and you can hang it above the plants, it should do fine. Implementing as many natural processes as possible when creating nature designs makes all the difference. Although these setups aren't truly natural, we can take inspiration from nature both aesthetically and functionally to produce amazing habitats that come close. It shouldn't be a battle either. Once these processes get going, things become extremely easy to maintain. I won't act like there's never anything to do, but most of the time it's just a matter of topping off the water, trimming the plants and roots, and maybe occasionally doing a gravel vac. Utilizing houseplants in this way has been a game changer for me over the past eight years, and I think it could be for many of you as well. I hope this helps get you started.